Tyler, great to have you on the show, man. Jesse, so happy to be here. Man, it's been amazing getting to know you, hearing your story and your journey. Um, for, for people that are listening and watching this show, it's all about that unique experience that people can come in and talk about. And everybody has some sort of journey. And, and some people have that hero's journey where they've overcome things and seen some really amazing things and done some beautiful things. And so tell the world a little bit more about Tyler Reiser and, and, and some, give them some context on your journey so far. Yeah. So a little bit of context, you know, I, I grew up just a small town, Minnesota, uh, nothing special, nice, nice family, you know, population 228 farm, farm area. So real small, uh, tried to get away from that real quick, moved away at 17, joined the military, uh, disarmed bombs for six years in the military, became a defense contractor for another four after that doing Intel work. Um, after that was sick of fighting wars. So I decided to take a break and traveled the world for a couple of years. And, uh, and then uh, after three and a half years of travel, moved to DC and, and started my transition into finance. And what branch of military did you serve? Uh, I was in the Air Force. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So we had, uh, I was Navy and we had a lot of air support because I was on an aircraft carrier. Oh yeah. So there was all support. sorts of helos and, and different types of planes and things that would come off and on. And um, there was a lot of air, airmen, as we called them, which are men and women. And there were people that I believe there were AOs. And I think that was their, their MOS or designation. And that's, those are the people that handle with like munitions and things like that. So when you were dealing with, um, and we'll get into like really maybe some, some instances in the military, some, some, some like, uh, in-depth stuff, but as far as like your day to day, what did that look like when you were in the military? I mean, day to day in the military, it's, it's a whole lot of hurry up and wait, you know, I, I don't know how many people you know, of, of you guys that are listening, I've actually been in the military, but it's it's not as glorious generally as as movies probably make it out to be. Um, I, I forget what that movie was. Was it Jarhead back in the day where it was just like, it was basically the Hunger Games of of the desert, just waiting around for, for the whole thing, you know? But was, that's a lot like the military is. You just wait around all the time. Um, but during that time when we're waiting around, often we're training and, and that's because of what our job was and, and the high, high risk nature of it. And, and just all the stuff you have to know, we're just constantly training. So we're, you know, we're constantly running scenarios for our other teams and we're, you know, setting things up to try to try to trick them and, you know, kind of a little spy versus spy type thing. Um, and, and having a lot of fun doing those things and just, just getting better at our jobs. And because, you know, what we knew was, six months from now, at least a third of us are going six months later, another third are going six months later, another third are going. So you're just preparing for the next deployment and, and getting ready to go. And, and hopefully you'll, you'll be prepared when you get there. It's a constant state of readiness. Like you have to be prepared and in the Navy, which I served in for a while, it's uh, they call them evolutions. And so anytime you're doing some sort of training and leveling up and, and trying to learn something new or, or really nail down a skill that you should know, whether it's your job or some sort of support service. Um, these evolutions really helped you kind of stay on task, but there was definitely a lot of like hanging around and playing cards and, and like, you know, just shooting the shit with your buddies. And then you just, you're just like itching it, for us to go out to sea because that's where we should be. Um, so for you, did you get a chance to go, uh, like you said, on a deployment and, and go over overseas and like, what did that look like for you? Yeah, I went to, uh, I guess, kind of non-deployment -de style. I went to like Bahrain back in 2005. I don't know Very, if you've been uh, there being a Navy military person. friendly country. Yes. Yeah. I had, you know, got a quick three-week trip over there. I got to kind of my first experience out, outside of the, the United States. And that, that was really cool. Yeah, it was really cool. And we got to hang out with some, you know, some other uh, nations' militaries for the first time. And that, that was cool as well. Uh, Did you meet any then, princes or princesses while you were over there? Well, I, th I think everybody that's an officer over there is like a part of the royal family in some yeah. way. Um, <laughs> it's it's really interesting just to, just meeting those people and 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 seeing how they operate and how their militaries operate. But uh, yeah, I mean, my primary deployments were uh, 2007 to Iraq, southern Iraq, and then 2008 to uh, to Afghanistan. Were you OIF one and two or two? Operation right. Um, I think we were sure you would ask me something like I've forgotten all of that stuff. Like yeah, anything that was while. number related. I know when I was in it was one <laughs> and I was in, in like four uh two thousand four, five, six and some change. So that was O I O I F one. I think I it was one, two. I can't remember. It could have been both. It doesn't matter. So so as far yeah. as like going through the military and then getting out, you started traveling the world a little bit, which is super, super exciting. 
Yeah. Travel, traveling was awesome. You know, I, I think the military kind of got me onto the travel bug. Cause even, you know, going and seeing those places is, it was incredible. It was incredible to go around and, and see what I got to see in, in Iraq, see what I got to see in Afghanistan, you know, to be out in those countries all as, you know, dangerous as it, as it is at, at times and in certain places. Um, it's still really amazing and, and just seeing a totally different culture, right. And, and interacting with a totally different culture. I think that started my kind of, uh, interest in travel. And, and then I thought to myself, well, I might as well go someplace, you know, I've been, I spent my entire essentially twenties, you know, in a desert, I might as well go find some tropical places to go hang out in and see what that's like. And you did find some tropical places we <laughs> before we came on the show about uh, breaking a Guinness Book of World Records. So yeah, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's you know I, I I love talking about this. It was so much fun and and really got to see in action. I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen the YouTube video. It's called I think it's called How to Start a Movement. I um, believe I did. It's the guy that was dancing. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this happened in real life. It it was that's what it felt like. That's like, like I was the crazy one dancing. Talk trying for to the get, people that don't know that video because that video is amazing. Talk about it is so good. That video, what, what's what's going on, and the and, and the how to start a movement video. Yes, yeah, the idea is there's one crazy person that gets up and they're doing this crazy dance, and everybody's looking at them like they're nuts, and and this person doesn't care. They're just doing it right because they know that they need to be doing this crazy dance, and then some other crazy person comes and joins them, thereby making the first person not crazy anymore. Right. And then, and now that, now that they see that this person is not crazy, they start to get the urge to join. So the early adopters will begin joining. And as the early adopters join the, uh, I forget what's the, what's the second stage of, um, there's, there's, so this, this is where I saw this was from it's a early, adop- a it's early adopters. And then there's, there's one more and then it's the laggards, right? Yeah. The, it's Simon, the, the late Simon movers, Sinek talked the, about this. the late movers. You saw, you saw it, you saw it through Simon Sinek. I, or? I, I think it's just a, a principle overall, yeah. uh, but it's like the technology adoption uh, pattern and, and it's the early adopters, the, I think the late movers and then the laggards. Yep. And then, and then crossing then my, the chasm to get to the other point, as far as like people that like go from the, the people that start in the beginning are like the crazy ones. Yeah. And then, and then the people, the first that, one's the guy dancing, right. Yeah, and and yeah. he's crazy. He's, he's, he's not, he's the one, he's the entrepreneur. And think about, think about the, the risk that that person's taking in terms of like the social side of things where people are potentially, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but people are probably judging that person at, at some level, but he's just out there living his best life. And he's truly just owning the moment. And because he's doing that and not giving a, a shit about what other people think, he's inspiring people that want to do the same thing. And because he was that first person to do it, then that one person, like you said, it's like that, that crazy person by themselves. Well, then if one person comes along and starts dancing with that crazy person, he's not crazy anymore. And then from there, you start building a following. And then by, at the end of it, it was like the people that were running up last, like they seemed like the weirdos cause they weren't up at the front, like front dancing. Yeah. You know? The laggards come yeah. in. Yeah. And, and it's the whole, that's the whole, you know, adoption of it. And, and I really felt this when we're, when we're in Thailand breaking this record, I mean, it was a mass participation record. So we needed a lot of people. Um, it was a scuba diving record. So we needed a lot of people that knew how to scuba dive. Um, fortunately we we're on an Island of 10,000 scuba divers, but, so we we had we had the potential pool to pick from. So the, the resources were potentially there. We just had to go find it, and and we had to what we we had to as the crazy people show the other people that what we were talking about wasn't crazy. What did um, that sound like when you're talking to the participants? Um, well, you know, on on game day, it sounded really good and confident, you know, and whether it was or not. You know, okay, so so person number three, four, or five, like the very early adopters, right? So there's the entrepreneur. They were so people. huge to everything. Yeah, they were so crucial. So so it was me, and I, I literally stood up to to my scuba. Dive. I was doing an instructor course, and and our instructor just got done teaching us uh, some module about dive physics or something, and uh, about like how how the gases in your body work as you're diving. Oh yeah, um, and. And I, I have this idea and I'm looking this thing up while, while I'm in this class and then I get done and I'm like, who wants to break a world record? 
<laughs> right. Just out of nowhere. I don't know. There's no context for this. Right. I just turned to everybody. Like, like it's just happening. of like, who's in, you know? And they're all like, what are you talking about, dude? We're not breaking a world record. That's not going to happen. <laughs> like, right. All look at me like I'm nuts. They're just like, this, this is not going to happen. I'm like, all right, well, you guys suck, but I'm going to go break this world record. So shaming them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Always shame the haters, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. You're like, all right, I'll I'll be back. I'll be here when you come back around and you come join me later. Yep. Yeah. When you when you when you catch catch the fever, so to speak, when things are momentum's being built. So you so you're getting people to come on board, and then a total of is it 62, 68 people? 62. 62. Yeah. How long did it take you from the first conversation with the very first early adopter? Maybe they adopted or didn't, but the very first person you started talking about this, maybe that class, all the yeah. way until you were ready to do this, the dance, so to speak, like to actually set and- month month and a half a month and a half okay yeah okay and then you also talked about uh getting funding for this excursion yeah so i mean we we needed we wanted to get a lot of people and and we we're planning anywhere from the the people that had done it before us had done 61 people ah, and right. so we're like okay you know we need to hit at least 62 and then we're planning for like levels beyond that, like up to possibly a hundred people show like, up. Like crush it. Yeah. Yeah. And we're like, okay. So I'm like, we're like, we're easily going to get 60 people to show up. We should, we should be able to get a hundred. Right. And, and we're like, we've got, you know, our, our pitch deck has like the different size pyramids and stuff in it that it, that it could be, you know, um, we're thinking it's going to be this much. It could be a little less, could be a little more. Um, but, uh, so now that you have people following you into this, this unknown, uh, super exciting, potentially world record setting endeavor, um, now you want to look for funding. And so you, you had 60 plus conversations to get the participants, give or take, if you have people helping you, I'm not sure, but you had, you had conversations. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was me, just me, just you. Just yeah, you. walk. Well, it was literally door to door. I think it was <laughs> one of your other episodes and talk about door to door sales. I love it. That's where I came from. That's my first. That's, sales that's my first sales job. First yes. one, door to door to door meat sales. <laughs> meat sales. Okay. Like, did you have a box of different meats? Yeah, a whole truckload of them. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yes, dude! Some of the best sales people came from outside sales, like that door to door. Yeah, and, and I'll get into that. And but you know, is is really the uh, you know because the people didn't join on right away. Everybody laughed at the idea right away. They told me it couldn't happen. They they told me that it wasn't going to happen. They said they're like, yeah, people have tried that. People, other people here have tried other group records. It doesn't work, you know, and, you know, in some sense you want to prove them wrong, but in, in some sense, it's just a really cool idea. Let's get this done. You know, there's no reason we can't. Um, and, and it really started to turn when um, I moved in with my two buddies, John and Manolo, and I brought the idea up to them and they were go from the start. And they're like, yeah, how do we do this? What do we need? And, and we just started planning it out. We're like, you know, we got to get people so we can do this diving. We got to figure out how we're going to do this thing. And then we need, we need to get, we're going to have 60, hundred people that need dive equipment, that need boats. Like how do you get a hundred people on a boat? Logistics. You need, you need some big boats, right? <laughs> so there's only, there's only a couple of dive schools on the island, probably three that have boats bigger than 30, 40 people. So you don't have too many chances there with them. And then everybody else has smaller boats, maybe 10, 15, 20 people. So it's like, okay, hopefully you get one or two of the big ones. And then, you know, maybe we can get you know, some of the smaller ones, but we really just had a ridiculous ask when we went there. <laughs> we, we came up we, we went to, I was going to the dive schools and I was saying, I need your biggest boat for a day. All the equipment that we need to maintain that boat. Meanwhile, they're selling each spot for a hundred bucks a spot, you know, normally per dive. <laughs> so, uh, think about how much money they're putting out on this, right? And, and we're saying, and you have to give us $500. <laughs> nice. And, and, you, and you, can bring, you can have somebody film it if you want to take pictures and use as much as you want of that. And that what that was, was the $500 cool. for? Um, the $500 was to like pay Guinness and to, because there's like fees to pay Guinness and there's sure. like other administrative fees just to, just to get things going. And, and, and then, the, so the only way, so how do you do an ask like that, right? You can't, you can't just go ask for that. Nobody will give that to you. So, so in the end, of course, what we did was uh, we, we did it for charity. And, and we chose uh, Coral Reef Conservation. Uh, made sense with our mission, what we we're doing. And uh, so when we went to these companies, we said, all the money we make, we're going to raise money during the event. 
we've got 10 vendors already lined up and they're going to give us all of their, all of their profits for the entire night and, or wow. the entire day, the entire event. And all of that's going to go to coral reef conservation. Incredible. So you, you, you found the, the urge and the excitement turned into getting a following of people, right? We're going back to that, that, that crazy dancer that was by himself. You're the crazy dancer. You're the entrepreneur. Yeah. You're, you're the founder. So we've got like four people, five people that are excited at this point. Well, that's all, that's all it takes. I mean, I've been in businesses before talking about outside sales. My first company I ever built was an outside sales business. And I had a team of people that would go door to door working on cold call. Uh, they, were, they were working on commission and they were cold calling and they were going business to business. So it was actually a little bit easier than what you were doing, which is going residential. Residential is a whole different game. And I've done residential before, but we were selling things that I think people really like, like uh, discounts on sporting events, discounts on restaurants, hotels, yeah. golf courses, like almost like Groupon, but before Groupon was really big. And so to get people to even want to do something like that is incredible. And so for you, you're getting people to like show up on their own time. They're going to tr- maybe break this record. And then on top of that, you have these people that are funding it for you. And it's all in the hopes of giving back to charity. So that was, that was an incredible testament to your belief and your ability to go from the crazy person to the guy that's the first one dancing in, you know, 200 people, which is incredible. That's it. And it's, you know, it, it, as the time went on and it really became once we started doing practices and, you know, we, we got 10 people together and said, Hey, come, come with us or 15 people were like, Hey, come do this first practice. And once, once they saw that we could do it with 15, I think it sparked in their eyes and they're like, Oh, we can, we can do this. We what has that taught you in business? I'm sure that probably gave you so much yeah. information and validation. Follow success. For, yeah. Yeah. If you follow success, you know, you, you gotta get the wins early, get small wins, build on them. Um, you know, you've, you've got to, if you're going to have a big, crazy idea, you have to have other milestones along the way that are, that are wins and you got to yep. celebrate the wins. And, and that's how, because people need an endpoint to judge you off of. They need, they need a point where they can say, oh yeah, that succeeded. Maybe the next one will. And, and then that helps to get them excited about it and bring them on board and bring the people that were on the fence, maybe on board and, and some people that were nosed to on the fence. So, so we know that you broke the record. Does the record still stand to this day? Uh, I haven't checked today, but um, I believe so. In the yeah. last couple of weeks, have you looked? <laughs> uh, no, but it, I haven't heard anything. I think maybe I'll get alerted once it has. But uh, okay. to, to my knowledge, there's there have been maybe four attempts so far to beat it, and it hasn't been done. Incredible. It's really cool to have that in your... Uh, not so much like people, there's people out there that are talking differently in the world of entrepreneurialism. There's people that are leading differently. There's one that I can think of. His name is Jesse Itzler, and he's here in Atlanta, Georgia. Jesse Itzler is the husband of Sarah Blakeney, who is the founder of Spanx, one of the most successful females in business in the world. Jesse's unbelievably successful too. He founded a company called Marquee Jet. He founded, um, I believe it was uh, the, one of the coconut waters that he sold to Coca-Cola, like he's, but he's, he's so about what's called building your life resume. So not just building your resume. Oh, yeah. yeah. For, for the, uh, awesome. yeah, the checkpoints of business and like the checkpoints, yeah. I worked at this company, I started this business. No, I did this with my family. We did this trip across, you know, wherever. And we, we experienced these things. And it sounds like for you, that's pretty much what you did. You added to your life resume, which is something that like most people would love to do. And, and I put it on my resume. Perfect. I, 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 I have a, my resume is essentially a life resume anyways. I mean, I, I have a three year gap in my, it really in my work history. So I just put it in their world travel and I have, you know, a couple of things that I'm proud of from those times and things that I was successful at. And, Hell yes. You know, generally people talk about that more than my work experience when I have an interview. Of course they do. It's interesting. It's fun. It's, uh, it's incredible. And, and so now that you had that experience, what was the next move? Was the next move another uh, big adventure or was it kind of like easing up and like kind of getting rerouted back into society in terms of like jobs and stuff like that? Like what, what were you doing next? Yeah. After the world record or, yeah, I mean, I, that was just the beginning of my travel. I mean, that was, that was within the first six months of me starting. I, I landed in Thailand in May. We broke the world record in October. Um, Very and, cool. and I stayed there until I think next April and then Europe for a year and a half, drove a car from a uh, tiny car, Citroen Saxo 1.1 liter, 
uh, I think it's a four cylinder <laughs> <laughs> with two people that are, are like six foot five, six foot seven, <laughs> right? <laughs> they're huge, right? They're, they're both bomb techs as well. And uh, yeah, we did this thing for, it's called another thing for charity, we did it for the EOD Warrior Foundation, uh, raised $15,000 for them. And, and we bought this really crappy car, did this trip called the Mongol Rally. You buy a car, you drive it from England to Mongolia. And, uh, you know, if you make it to Mongolia, then you, then you win. Wow. Okay. So talk about <laughs> that a little bit. What was the, what was the uh, commitment to that, the process in terms? Because for people that don't know, whenever you're doing a long, long trek like that, like logistics become a huge factor. Yeah. Eating, sleeping, um, you know, if you just bought some random car for some cheap money, like you have to have people that can actually fix that thing. $600. Right. So, you know, that there's probably some issues and maybe you got lucky, maybe you made it the whole way, but talk a little bit about that journey because it's, it's incredible. The ingenuity that has to happen on that trip. Yeah. We're super lucky that we had, you know, three former bomb tax. I mean, when it comes to people that have the ability to, you know, figure out a way to rig things together to make it work. That's, that's what, you know, bomb techs are made for. Um, but, uh, I mean, the whole thing is just as you're always, you're constantly resupplying, you know, you're constantly thinking about half the time we slept outside, you know, we, we just had, we build makeshift, like it, they, they changed over time, you know, our, our lean to that came off the side of our car looked one way when, you know, we're only a week into the trip, but it, it looked much different, you know, uh, three weeks in, um, <laughs> you know, how annoyed we were with each other. That that changed dynamics, a lot, you know. Social dynamics of being so oh, close yeah. together, yeah. And then you get to Mongolia, and there's just like no road for a week and a half. Life is so I, different out there. <laughs> it's it's so cool though, like to to be like we need to go between those two mountains, and then you just go. So you know, you, it's just like freedom. Was there a time limit on, on on how long this trip could take? No. Okay. So you went out there and it took you about... And everybody years. takes... There's like two, 300 teams. Everybody takes a different route. You see people randomly along the way. It's really cool. That's super cool. What Anything interesting, scary, or crazy happen along the trip? Um, well, I know one team, uh, they hit a camel. They're driving at night. It broke the number one rule. You don't drive at night. And they oh, hit a camel. Right. And since the camel's so tall, they like took out its legs and it like fell onto the car. And like the one guy like broke his neck. Well, so like, you get through. Yeah, run into deers all the time. And, and oh yeah, the deer pops up and hits the winch. It can cause death. Same in Minnesota, constant. Yeah, it's incredible. So never mind a camel that's bigger, heavier, and taller. Oh man, It'll just fall over and like squish the top. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's you know the world's pretty safe unless you go looking for trouble. Yeah. I, I find you know in in three and a half years, I've I found a couple you know bits of trouble in my time, but you know it's always you know three a.m. You know, right, witching out. I'm alone. For out. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You get back in the house where you're supposed to be. Right. right. So, <laughs> but, so you, did, you did the, uh, what is that? You said it was called the, um, where they used to do the, the, the cross country car ride. It's, uh, and like Steve McQueen used to do it. And it was like, it, it's similar to that relay, whatever. I'll think of it, but it's, uh, it's, you did this like huge trek. How many miles in total? Yeah, it's like 10,000, 10,000 miles, wow. I think, like six weeks just driving constantly. Any issues finding gas or uh, supplies? Water, no, food, that that seemed like uh, strangely it was quite easy. Um, okay. we, we thought it was going to be harder, especially like once we got to Kazakhstan, it got a little bit harder. But I mean, all the way from England to, to Georgia, I mean, it's pretty. You're just it's like driving in America. Yeah, that's beautiful. You probably saw some amazing things too. How about uh, people? Any interesting people that helped you along the way? I was really surprised by the Mongolians. The Mong- I, and now I really want to go back. I'm, I've got a trip that I'm planning now. It's kind of my long, long-term plan trip. Uh, I want to go back to Mongolia because the people there are just so friendly. And like you can, they live in these things called yurts. I don't know if you've ever seen those. What They're is like, that? It's like this. It looks like a, a silo almost, like a, like a round. It's like round, and then it's got just a kind of rounded off top. And but they're big. They're like 20 feet wide. Okay. And, and so you can sleep like 10 people in one probably. And you can just walk into these people's, these are like these people's homes 
And you can just walk in and go sleep on their floor and they're cool with it. They'll give you food. They're just like trade things. Unbelievable. There it's is, amazing. The guy, the guy, I'll send you the guy's name after we're done. Um, but he did an amazing trek as well. Like, what, And he set a world record for this. It, I forget where it was from and too, but uh, he was on Joe Rogan. And he was talking mm. about how a lot of these almost, they're almost like indigenous kind of places. Like it's very yeah. rural, very, very salt of the earth. He was like, he went into one of these places on this, this voyage that he did. And one of the people was like almost trying to give him their wife. Like, like, like they're so, yeah. They're so nice. Yeah. They're so nice. They're like, <laughs> you want her? <laughs> right. Right. Totally different culture too. And, and they have, and they're cool with it. <laughs> so, and, and you're invited on this, this trip that I have coming up and you know, it's, I think it's going to be amazing, but it's, it's really going to take some work because it's in Western Kazakhstan or sorry, Western Mongolia, which is uh, essentially on the border of Kazakhstan, really remote. I mean, it takes two week, two weeks to get there by car and there's no road. Wow. So, but what I want to do is I want to, I want to buy two horses per person. And then we're going to go up into the mountains in Western Mongolia. And we're going to go hang out with the, there's a tribe up there that hunts with golden eagles. And these things are like four I've feet tall. I've seen the videos of this. Yeah, I'm going to go find them. Incredible. And they'll, like, yeah. they'll pick off wolves. Yeah. Have you seen this? Yeah, it's amazing. It's crazy. And I've seen these eagles. They're, I've held these eagles. They're I, massive. They're I as big as I am. The, the, the claw and talon strength, like just holding It's on. just like this big. It's insane. Yeah. Videos, check them out on YouTube for people listening and watching. Um, you know, these these folks that are like they they I don't know if it's the same exact, you know, people, but they'll ride on horses, they live in the mountains. Yeah, same they'll, people. They'll fly these eagles from a top of a mountain and they'll go pick up. But you like, can't get there. Yeah. You're like this place is so remote. <laughs> like so remote. Like this is gonna be this is a real trip. Like this will take real planning and for real sure. skills, you know. That's so cool. I, I actually like one of the prep prep things I did. My dad goes elk hunting every year, um, and out in New Mexico and they take mules out there. Okay. So I went, I went out with them last year, just, just hiking with them and, uh, learned how to take care of animals out in like really remote locations. Yeah. Like your support animals, like the people, yeah. the animals that have to help you and people don't realize. And that's when I decided I was going to get two. I was going to get one, one horse. And then I was like, Oh, I need two. Yep. And everybody needs two. One for you, one for supplies kind of thing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, people don't realize, and, and, and the physical strength and, and conditioning that us as people have to have when you go hunting in those types of conditions too, the endurance, hills and, 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 and brush and things you have to do to kind of navigate during certain, you know, different landscapes have different issues, but the fitter you are, the better served you are to be able to like handle and, and, and have a cleaner hunt versus, you know, an animal that you're, you, you know, you, you put down and it's, it's waiting for a while because you can't get there quick enough to kind of finish the job if, if it's not done correctly the first time. So I think that there's a lot of people out there that are really big on conservation. There's a guy that I follow. His name is Cam Haynes. And if you know who Cam Haynes is, he's, he's an incredible uh, example of mindset and work ethic. And he's always, again, I go back to Joe Rogan. He's a big influence in, it in a lot of what I do, but he's always on Joe Rogan's podcast talking about how to be fit to be able to hunt and to be able to do it. If you're going to be a hunter and you're going to live off of, you know, what God's given us, um, he kind of sets the example on how to do that. So, yeah, and you know, I'm not, I'm not a big hunter. I, I, I don't remember the last time I went hunting, but, uh, but it's, you know, it's awesome to get out there in nature and you know, go hike those 70 miles in a couple of days, up hills, steep hills, and a lot of work. You know, oh, it's great. <laughs> I love it. So, so from there, are you, are you still traveling the world for a little bit at that point? After you know, I, I remember there was like the Cannonball Run for your Cannonball Run to Mongolia. Yeah. yeah. So I basically just went there, and then I just kept going. I kept going that direction. Um, we we basically hired a guy. Our car broke down as soon as we got back. Got to the the pavement on in Mongolia. It, our car just we had one brake left and it just wasn't safe you come in with a tire spinning off the car as you roll into town is, is about to, we'd have we'd have to pull over every like 45 minutes take the back wheels off pound the 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 inside the tire the wheel well we have to pound it in because it'd be it would crush down and and be rubbing on the tires <laughs> be, because our whole car other than like right under the seat or other than the roof our whole car was split in the middle so it wasn't actually even connected underneath the back seat. That's crazy. It was like two cars connected by a roof. <laughs> <laughs> Some hack job, someone out there just like put this thing together. Like, I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, then I just kept going. I, I went from there to the Philippines, um, hung out with some friends that my friends that I knew from Thailand. 
a kind of a reunion for about three months. Then I, then I moved to Mexico for nine months and, and that's when I moved to DC. What are you doing for money at this point? Are you, are you living off money you saved up while you were in the air force? Yeah, I was, uh, so not, not when I was in the air force, uh, that was when I was defense contracting. I, right. I, I used to say, uh, uh, what was it? You know, right, right place, right time, right war, right expertise. Um, being, being, a uh, you know, what they call a subject matter expert on improvised explosive devices at that time was fairly lucrative. Right. Um, and, and I just didn't waste any of it. You know, I just saved it all, invested it all. And, and then I got to that point where I, I wanted to make a move into something different and I just took three and a half years off. Unbelievable. And, and I, you know, I, I had more money when I got done than what I started with. So. <laughs> Cause you were like, <laughs> spending it like you would if you were like 15,000 a year. It cost to travel is nothing. Insane. Insane. So you've really built that life resume. You've been able to have these experiences. And this is what I tell people all the time, clients, friends, family, you know, cause I'm, you know, we're in finance. I'm a, I'm a wealth planner and investment advisor. And I talk to people about yeah. the mindset of saving money until you're 65 and then living when you're 65 is such backwards thinking. It's like, yeah. yes, you need to plan for the future. I get that, but you also need to live while you're alive. And you need to be able to live while you're younger. You know, whenever you start saving or investing for the future, that's going to be the, the youngest that you are. Every day that goes by, you're older. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. And so for someone like you that was able to work in the military, defense contractor, and have this, you know, safety net, so to speak, you said, screw it. And you chased after things that would build your life resume, which is, I think, unbelievable. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, having those skills and, you know, the like financial skills that you're talking about and the wealth picture is so important and, and not enough people actually have, have the right advice for that. It's so hard to find in, in the world today too of, of real good advice. So uh, it's always good to see people that, that do provide good advice in that, in that realm, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, it's so much different now and, and you, and you have to, you do have to, I, I see less people planning for the future or today you know, they're just, they're just spending. They don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not even like living for the moment. They don't even know where it's going. It's just yeah. unintentional spending. It's, you know, it's just mindlessness. Bad habits, um, not thinking through. I mean, it's, it's one of those. Well, things. what is the opposite of mindfulness? It yeah. must be mindlessness, right? Pretty much. So, I mean, if you're being intentional, you're being mindful, you know where things are going. If you're being mindless, you're just letting it slip through the cracks and, oh, I you know, spent $800 last month on coffee. Um, you know what it is too. It's all, it's all psychology. And it's all emotional behaviors, and there's a lot of things that oh, yeah. come to the practical side of it that people weren't taught. People weren't taught, you know, these fundamentals that they have to go to a financial planner for. They have to go to somebody who knows this information as they get, you know, or they can try to seek it themselves. But then, you know, if you're a do-it-yourselfer, you got to learn one way or the other. Whether you it's know. you know, I, I was do-it-yourselfer for a long time, and and you know, I, I would still call myself a do-it-yourselfer, although you know, I also maintain all the professional licenses as well. So, um, but, but also I get the advice of other people smarter than me, even wise though counsel. I, you have to have yeah. wise counsel, mentors, coaches, uh, people that you align with that, you know, have done what you want to do at a good level and you can follow them down the right path. Oh yeah. So the where I was going is just in terms of the advice is out there. The inf information is out there, but it's the behaviors that you really have to change. You have to change mm -hmm. people's behaviors that they, they never learned or that maybe you got to trick yourself. Yeah. And it's all you got to trick yourself. You got to trick yourself until you're good enough at it to not need to do it anymore. That's it. The way, the way I did it, the way I did it was, um, I got an account and then I opened this account you trade? and they're like, no. Oh, well, if you want to get into my trading life that, I mean that while I was traveling, I was trading. And, and actually for any of you traders out there that, that, you know, I was trading futures and commodities. I was trading that's even the S and P 500 futures. I was a licensed commodities broker. Oh. Um, but like I was trading e mini S and P's, you know, trading million dollars of contracts. Um, and you're leveraged 20 times. So you can do that. Yep. But it's so dangerous. And, and, and I've gone through the swings, you know, I've gone, I've made $15,000 in a day. I've made $30,000 in a day. I've lost $20,000 in a day. Scary. It's, it's scary. It's scary. And, and you know, you you feel like you have an edge and you can figure something out. But if you really, once you, once you learn more, because then I educated myself more and studied finance for another three years, 
and and really learn the science behind it and how stupid what I was doing was. Yeah. <laughs> and and I was like, and I looked at it anyways, and I said, you know, had I just put all that money in a well diversified portfolio, I'd have double the amount that I had. Yep. It's the long game, and and that's you know I'm I'm very much. You just can't beat the market. Just participate. No, there's out of all the money that's managers it. out there, four percent of them can beat the market, and that's four percent out of and just and that's like, random four percent. That four percent in one given given year probably. It always changes, and here's the thing. <laughs> Out of 300 and something, you know, there's last time I checked between 360, 380,000 financial planners that are registered in the United States, 4% of them. And that's not even, that's the world. So like how many other people in the world are trying to do that? But that's not where you make your money anyways, right? You You don't make your money by beating the market. And that's what people don't understand. You make your money by participating in the market yes. and, and by sh- shielding yourself from taxes and, and by protecting your principal. And, and making sure that you're not speaking you're not, my language, brother. I, love I, it. I hear you, man. I love it. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's unfortunately until people are at this level, it's, it's how the rich get richer. It's using businesses legally to be able to shield yourself, to keep more of your money, to pay less in taxes, to be able to get things throughout the course of the year at cheaper discounted rates, whether it's gas, whether it's cost of goods and services, whatever it is, there's so many ways to do these things that just the information that people don't have is what screws them up. If you have an LLC for a legitimate business or an S corp, there's things that those businesses can do that if you didn't have them, you'll never be able to keep your money. And the other thing about that, that I really talk to people about is if you don't learn how to stop trading time for money, you'll always have a job. Like if you can't find a way to make money while you're asleep, you're always going to be working for somebody else. Yeah. And so there's, there's a lot of work that I do with people to show them how to do that, to teach them how to do that. And I don't know for you and for your clients, cause you're, you're in finance as well. Um, I do uh, corp, mostly corporate finance now, corporate, and corporate small, finance. small business finance on my, yep. with my consulting business. Yeah. Okay. Talk a little bit about that. So I know, I know that you're in that, in that game. What does that look like for you and your clients? How are you servicing them? Um, from, on, from a, personal side or and from an employment side. So I, I basically have a side side hustle now and I'm, I'm fully employed as well. Yeah. Um, I'm, on my, for the company I work for, we, we do consulting. I'm a management consultant with the, with the company. And what we do is we help uh, fortune 500s do uh, financial project management. So looking at all of the cash flows of different projects and, you know, I might have a $15 million project and I'm looking at, you know, how much are we paying this contractor, or this vendor each month? Income statements, all the financial reports, all that. Yeah, just just bringing in all the financial, just basically the operations of the finances throughout the project, right? Yep. Um, and and our company does other things as well, but that's that's currently what I'm working on. Um, and then out, outside of that, uh, you know, my my own private company, uh, Strategic Bonds. What we do is we help we help smaller businesses, you know, more in the one to five million dollar range. Yeah. Uh, really add strategy to their. A lot of businesses finances. are in that demo. A lot of businesses are yeah. in that one to five million dollar range. Yeah, and you know they they have all the same problems, and they're they're doing all the same. You know, the, if you can just get to them ten years before, generally when they want to start talking to somebody, they can solve a lot of the problems before you you got to wait and 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 fix them later. So. And, and strategic bonds is the name specifically. Are you only dealing in bonds with the company? No, actually, we have we have nothing to do with bonds. Bonds um, and the t- like, like the yeah, it's, like, it's the the bonds that bind us together. Gotcha. Okay, <laughs> okay, and and so so for for a client for someone that's wanting to accomplish you know something like how, how do you come in and and optimize that transaction or that project? What are some things that you're you're coaching them on or teaching them? to be able to hit whatever goal it is they're trying to hit? Well, I mean, I, I, think, it, I think it comes down to a few things, right? So you, you've got to make sure really the financial picture is, is quite simple at the start. Really, really it's, you know, you, you have your, your asset picture over time and how that grows um, throughout, throughout its life cycle. And, and then you really have your income picture. So depending on, you know, a lot of business owners have multiple businesses or may, they may just have one, but but how are they taking that business and, and using it to impact their personal lives in a way that's beneficial to them and advantageous? Yep. So, you know, there, there are a lot of things that business owners, because they own the business, that they can do that others cannot. And, and those are the strategies where, you know, the, the mom and pops of the world, they have huge advantages and they can, they can really, their businesses can be a way to, to free them financially and, you know, a side hustle can do the same thing as well. Of course. 
you know, just have a legitimate purpose. And, and if, if you don't have something you can sell, then go get some skills. That's it. Like invest in yourself, best investment you'll ever make. Okay. Invest in yourself, your business, your people, your clients. Um, one more thing about business, but I want to talk about your book. It looks like it's uh, behind us. Is that your book, The Veteran Advantage? That's it. Yeah. So before we jump, jump into that, I want to talk real quick about um, any pivots or adjustments you've had to make during Corona for yourself, for your business, for your clients. Yeah. I mean, not a ton. I, I do a lot of my work remote anyways. I mean, I'm in, I'm in DC, but most of my clients are, are not in DC and, okay. uh, and the company I work for is not in DC either. So, so it hasn't really been a huge impact on that. Um, I'm actually quite excited about it because I'm, I'm waiting for the digital revolution. Um, but I think there are a lot of laggards in the world that are still trying to hold that back. And, and I, I think this is really going to push us forward and are we talking and people like getting comfortable with it. Um, I, I won't even go down that route. Um, I I just, I just think crypto it's, it's just, there's, there's probably something to blockchain and well, there's probably, it's not even a probably there's stuff to blockchain. Right. Um, crypto, maybe there's a future for it in some way or another, but, uh, Hey, good luck fighting the American government. Listen, I get it. I I believe in the blockchain (laughs) itself, the technology, the underlying technology behind all of the, you know, the Bitcoin, the Ethereum, the Litecoin, all that stuff. I, I'm not sure about the actual physical, or not really even physical, but the idea of the, the cryptocurrency itself. I don't know if it's good because there's no real value in it. It's just, you know, whatever I want to sell it for today, whatever. Yeah. Recently, just I think the other day just split, which people don't really even kind of understand where they think they're making more money, but it's getting diluted at this point. So they're, yeah. they're making less money. It's just, I, I'm a rebel at heart. I've you know been in the military. I've been in banking you know before I had my own business, and I've had businesses through the years. So I've always been kind of a rebel at heart, and I've always I've always hated bureaucracy. And the military, I came to it, but like in the in the banking world, I did really well with it. But I really see the need for a disruption, and and, and maybe even decentralization one day. But I don't know if the actual cryptocurrency itself is going to be the thing that kind of catapults us past. Well, look, can I ask you a question? Sure. What's stopping you from from diversifying your currency today? So, currency itself, or are we talking portfolio? Just, I mean, just in general. I mean, like you can buy the world's currencies as well. So, like, for sure, is is that something that people are actually looking for? You know, I I don't know. You know, I, I think there I think there are ideas there about it not being controlled by a government, but I I think at that point, you know how are we going to move? And this is, might be a great question. How do we, how do we as a globalizing globe (laughs) or people, how, how do we move into a globalized world? That's, that's less um, fixated on, on nations and more fixated on, on, on people as humans and individuals and, and people that are, that are all working together, trying to live in, in, in a place that's, you know, just good and, and, have enough food and enough shelter and, and meet your hierarchy of needs and hopefully one day do awesome shit. The, sh- the short answer is unfortunately that probably won't happen in our lifetime because of greed and capitalism. The, the woo answer, the spiritual answer, which is where I'd like to be yeah. is if people could check their ego, if they could work more on consciousness and awareness, which I'm huge into outside of business if people could learn how to operate as human beings and not try to outdo their competitors and you know, there's, there's a need for capitalism. I get it, but the society that we live in, the world that we live in, as much as I'd like to see that happen, I don't believe that it will, especially yeah. in our lifetime. I'm 38. I don't know how old you are, but at 38 years old, if I'm halfway <laughs> there on a scale of like almost 80 years old, based on longevity, who knows if I'll even make it that long, it'd be, it'd be a blessing. But as much as I want to see that happen, unity consciousness and coming together and living harmoniously, it's a short amount of time to accomplish that in the world. You know, you say short amount of time, but I, I mean, I'm 35. Um, I, don't, I don't know how old you are. Uh, but there are people alive today that know people or that, that knew people that had slaves. Yeah. And, and that's outrageous, right? Like, like how we've moved so far in equality and so little at the same time, right? It's both. It's but, far and none. Yes. Yeah, ex- exactly. But at, at the same time, what was life like then? 
Night and day. Versus now. Night and and so, and, and even with technology and medicine, all that stuff is way better. But, but, but the, I mean, there are people alive today that there are people alive today that were pre depression. Not many, but there are some. Yeah, there's some. But at the end of the day. So, so like in our lifetimes, like how different. And, and that, this is an interesting thing. I, I'll ask you this. So I, I like to think of this. How will the world be different and how will it be the same? Right. Because I think what we, what I, what I feel like is always the same is we continue to have people that want to socialize and come together and, and want to get meals together and want to go get drinks together or, you know, come together as groups. Yep. Right. And the things that change are just like the way in which we communicate, the way in which we, we get transported. Sure. Yeah. So, that's, that's so I ask you, I, I ask you how, how are, how are we going to remain the same today and how, how will we be different in let's as say long, 50 years? As long as human needs are what they are, um, significance, love, um, you know, all those different things that like the core tenets of like things that not, 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 not like sleep, food and water needs, but like the things that people crave, as long as we're humans and as long as we crave those things, right. there's going to be a, a baseline that doesn't change for us. There's going to be yeah. a baseline that yes, the, the far end of this is who knows one day if our consciousness won't be able to be downloaded into something else. And like, we're just not meat sacks anymore. And there's people yeah. working on this. Right. So, so Elon Musk has a company, one of his like four or five companies. This mm -hmm. one's called Nor Neuralink. Neuralink, yeah. Neuralink. And, and it's, it's responsible. They already have a prototype. Of, it's insane. Yeah. They can it's already insane. connect to your brain. Yeah. They have, a, have you seen the uh, computer that just like sticks the things in your brain? It's incredible. It's coming. It's and coming. we're also the, the dealing world. with, uh, for those that are super religious and big into that stuff, they're talking about the mark of the beast and all this stuff. But we're really dealing with a lot of government control issues right now. And the mm -hmm. amount of control that we've just given our governments and I know it's scary, stay at home and like, listen to us and whatever. It's really hard for governments to want to give that back. It and is. Then, and then, and then it's bad the precedent. Second, yeah. And the people that are out there, they're trying to make a good difference. Like, but like they're doing kind of crazy stuff. Like, um, there are these, um, injections and different things they're given. They could give to people that would Mike, say, Hey, Mike Pence is protesting. He didn't even wear a mask the other day. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. There was a video I saw of a lady talking about what to do and what not to do. She's like, don't touch your face. And then like one, one, like two minute clip, she touched her face seven times talking. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so like there's, there's things that are happening out there with technology and medicine where they'd be able to like implant a device in you or, or, or yeah. nano devices to say, Tyler has been infected with, let's say Corona, because this is the perfect uh -huh. time for it. And, or he's been around a group of people in his travels because they're tracking you they're yeah. around people. That, so it's hard to yeah, say. China's already that. doing this with like cell phones and like I they know. already started the social thing. Yeah, I know. It's scary. It's and that's freaking nuts. So that's what, work, working in Intel, I got really scared from all of that. And it, like at almost a level of par paranoia. And I'm just like, I don't want to be, I don't even want to know anymore because. Have of, you followed Snowden at all in his story or have you heard? heard a, a, a little bit. Yeah. Okay. You know. So, so, but without getting into like big conspiracy yeah, theories good. and crazy stuff to answer your question, as long as we're human beings, flesh, bone, mortal, we're going to have human based needs and those will play out different ways. The flip side of that is with technology advancements, medicine advancements, hopefully social advancements, right? Yeah. Things will change. But I will tell you, if I had to bet everything, I'm not a betting man because I don't believe in betting. It's the worst thing you can do. Um, one of the worst things. Well, if I had to bet, bet everything, everything. If I, if, I had, if I had bets with the right probability, I would bet. There you go, right? Like if it was a guarantee, <laughs> which whatever. But um, if, if I had to bet, I would say that 40 years from now, that was kind of where this stemmed from. I don't think we'll be where we should be, where we could be in yeah, terms of society. I, I agree. And everything. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, but how, like, how do we, so how do we advance more? I mean, what, what, what is it that we're not doing that's, that's preventing us from, I mean, a lot of it's Netflix probably, you know, tech, I, I think one of my theories is technology is advancing but it's really only advancing for a few that are using it. Like there's machine learning right now and there's people that know how to use that. Yeah. Like we're screwed. 
if we don't, if we don't start figuring that out, like, like people are going to be so much more advanced than we will. There's something that Google, uh, Google has access to now in form of a technology. And I forget it's a quantum based technology that like, it's almost like sci-fi that we don't think it would even exist, but they actually are operating with it now. And so my answer to, um, that question is basically, and it's going to, this is going back to the woo woo side of things. Sure. Is, is, is people as a collective need to have their consciousness at whatever level it's at right now, awakened further, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, it's going to sound really silly for this, you know, person that I am day to day that believes in this thing over here. It's going to come down to being able to love your human next to you, Tyler and Jesse looking, I see you through my eyes. So treating human beings as if they're an extension of you. And if every single person looked at every single other person in the world, Mm. As if they were seeing themselves, that would cause way less wars. It would cause Definitely. way less issues. And so that's something, again. Why is it always the veterans that are talking about not going to war? Because <laughs> we understand to a degree whether you've been overseas and, or if you saw death up front. I saw death in, a, death in a few different ways in my life, not in war, but through personal experiences. You understand the value of life. Yeah. And you don't want to revisit that if you don't have to. And right. you, you understand that if people treat each other a certain way, we would be leaps and bounds ahead of where we are. It's just, unfortunately, whether it's greed, whether it's misinformation, whether it's personal biases, whether it's personal beliefs, whether it's religious, whatever it is. Yeah. If, if we can't get past those things, we'll never get to this utopia that could be. Yeah. And you know, it's, you're absolutely right. And what's, what's scary and what sucks is that, you know, during this time, everybody's working together. Like the majority of the world's working together, right? It's a beautiful thing right now. Yeah. It's amazing. Right. Where most of us are staying home, doing our thing, you know, right. It sucks. Nobody wants to, we're doing it. We're doing it. Nobody's making this really. The, the, the accidents that have come way down because people aren't driving on the roads. Think about the pollution. The hospitals are actually empty right now. I heard, I heard that there's dolphins in Venice, Italy, in that corrupt, gross water that's this brown, disgusting water. There's like dolphins that people are seeing now because we're not polluting the world as much anymore. Yeah, it's crazy. So yeah, so we're just all of a sudden, but 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 it's having other effects, right? And but sure, what, depression, well, divorce, alcoholism, drugs, everything. Sure, sure. Well, hopefully we don't always have to be cooped up in a house, and and maybe we can all be mindful and figure out ways to deal with ourselves like that, right? I just want to hug people again. Yeah, right. <laughs> but. But I think this, you know, this idea that like we can already see, I mean, Amazon's out of stuff. The shelves are dry on Amazon, right? So like supply chains are getting thin right now. Yeah. You know, it's it's because like all all of these, like we all rely on each other. And I like I like to think of human the human race or species as one organism, almost almost like a coral reef, right? Like a coral reef is made up of a bunch of really little tiny microorganisms yep. and and i think of like if you think of the earth as just covered in those those little human microorganisms and us just running around doing these things but we're all just supporting each other and, and doing our little part you know you look, think about the idea that no one person can build a pencil something just really simple you know but it takes a whole world and a whole global supply chain to do that yep. and and it takes everybody so so we just need to get over this whole idea and and I don't know how we do it. I, I hope people, I, maybe it's, I think it's travel. I think that's just travel exposure, huge. exposure to other people that are not like you. Yeah. And you know what other, another thing that's coming back online that's really great is uh, plant medicines. And so mm. there's, there's people that are, you know, leading the way with this. Yeah. My uh, wife's getting into this. She's, uh, she's getting into functional medicine. She's a nurse practitioner. Unbelievable. And it's all, it's all about, it's amazing. Just like all the things that, I mean, most, most medicines are made from plants anyways, but yep. just, you know, getting, solving the problem where it is in the body is amazing. It's beautiful. And even, even, even like psychedelic type stuff, like there's a lot of people that are, that are getting awakened to what it means to be a good person and, uh, you know, yeah. great in relationships and great in business. You know, there's so many things out there. It's, it's great for depression, anxiety, all these things. And it was it was held down years ago, uh, specifically in the Reagan kind of administration with the war on drugs. 
And, you know, as far as like things like psychedelic, like mushrooms or ayahuasca, there's so many things out there that we have access to that are natural found in nature that can give you transcendent experiences and cure things that are going on in your life. And so I think as this starts to come more online, as people start to awaken more and their consciousness is elevated a little bit more, I think we are experiencing a definite shift in society right now for those good parts, but change on a 7 billion people scale over the course of, you know, a few years is probably not likely. It's going to take a while for it to happen. No, I, I, I think you're right. And, and we'll, we'll see how it all happens. It's a surprise every day, you know? Yeah, it is. Well, listen, man. So as far as um, your book, I want to touch on that before, we, before we bounce off. So for the veteran advantage, talk to people a little bit about what, what inspired you, what's the book about, what has it done in terms of relationships for you and things that you've seen happen with the book? Yeah. I mean, the book, you know, as far as relationships, if you want to go meet a bunch of people that like shouldn't give you the time of day, writing a book is the best way to do that. Um, so if best you want to have a podcast, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a great business card. It's a, it's just a great way to be able to, you know, engage with people on a different level and, and just like this engage with people in a collab- collaborative sense versus, you know, me trying to sell you something, you trying to sell me something, you know, we can just get together and make something together and, and, and that's fun. You know, that's interesting. So, so that's, that's really, I, I didn't really have any ideas about what the book was going to be about. Um, when I first started writing it, um, it was more so I settled on, on the idea of veterans and entrepreneurship. And, and from there, I thought I should just ask a bunch of smart veteran entrepreneurs and they probably know better what my book should be about than I would. Right. And, uh, research essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, I just interviewed, I interviewed, you know, 10, 12, uh, really amazing veteran entrepreneurs, you know, like Casey Lawrence, Donnie O'Malley, um, uh, Jim uh, Rodorfer, who's he's not a veteran, but he works with, he's a co-founder of Force Blue with Rudy Reyes. Um, let's see, the Marine rapper, you know, just like oh, awesome. all, all these people. And, and let me give a shout out to the Marine rapper because uh, he's about to launch a rap video for the Veteran Advantage. Super excited about awesome. that. When so, is that going to drop? Is there an ETF? Uh, no, no date released yet, but uh, super excited for when this comes out. I don't Very know if you've cool. heard his stuff, but it's he is a legend. So a link, I can't so wait. I'll, put a, I'll, I'll have my editor update it in the show. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll send you a couple. He, he's got some good ones. But uh, but yeah, anyways, uh, just rambling on here. What, what was I uh, li- so alluding to? Oh, so just... Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, really, I just did these interviews and and got to know what they were talking about, and and really, they started all saying the same thing. So it became clear what the chapters of the book should be, and then from there, did a bunch of research on those topics and got down into the science of of why these things are true, um, and 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 why this makes sense, and and so it saved yourself a whole lot of time and research on on going out there and finding it yourself. Just just go find out the research in the back of the book. Oh, yeah. I always just say you don't even have to read the book. Just read, just read the, uh, you know, the end, and 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 you'll see all the links to the research. You're selling yourself short there, but uh, but that's, that's <laughs> the, the the pay it forward mentality. So listen, man, it's been a beautiful time with you. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. There's there's definitely a, a second part coming, so we need to run this back because there's so much that we talked about that I want to delve into a little bit more. But uh, for those that want to connect with you and learn more about what you have going on personally or in your business, what's the best way they can find you? I mean, best way to find me is just LinkedIn. That's the best way to find anybody today. Just go on LinkedIn, type in Tyler Reiser, R-E-I, spell the German way, means traveler. Um, Does it really so, mean traveler? Yeah, man. It means traveler in German. So if you're like that Tyler guy, what was his name? What's that? You live, your ethos, like, like you've been traveling around the world and that's your name. That's crazy. I learned that, I learned that from a German person while I was traveling. Unbelievable story. <laughs> Listen, it's been a huge pleasure. You have an amazing journey, amazing gifts to give back to the world. For those of you that are listening and watching, make sure you check out Tyler Riser. He's doing great things. He's a super humble guy. He pays it forward. Be sure to pour into him because he'll pour into you 10x. He's Tyler Riser. I'm Jesse T. Be sure to catch us on next week's episode of The Jesse T Show.